Good morning. Good morning. And Tom Sherwood is your alleged enforcer. We're already behind, so no applause. We do have to move ahead rather rapidly. So, um, first is the... Uh, but first is, thank you for being here. Thank you for yeah, allowing us to be here. See how polite we are in the South? And you should know that we do have live interpreters, and the proceedings are being aired close captioned. That said, we can now begin with the presentation of the colors by the Metropolitan Police Department Honor Guard. Thank you very much, Sergeant Alexia Austin Love. And thank you very much to the Metropolitan Police Department Honor Guard. While you are still standing, on many of these occasions in the past, the master of ceremonies was Channel 9's Bruce Johnson. Bruce, who served this community for so long, who reported in this community for so long, is no longer with us in the flesh, and even though Tom and I are poor replacements for him. We stand, nevertheless, in the shadow of Bruce Johnson. So 
I'd like to ask you all to observe a moment of silence in memory of Bruce Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce and I were competitors, but we were not enemies. It was a great time to spend time with him, and we honor his memory today. We also want to recognize, I think we, you may be seated. We want to recognize the former council members and, and mayors in attendance. We'll ask them to stand and be recognized. Uh, the list I have is Brandon Todd, council member Brandon Todd. Council member Jack, wait, hold the applause please because it's a long list. <laughs> council member Jack Evans, former chairman Kwame Brown, Kathy Patterson, and now the auditor, council member Alyssa Silverman, council member Sandy Allen, and council member Bill Lightfoot. If there are any others I miss, I apologize. Let's have one round of applause. Oh, and Yvette Alexander's already shouting down here in front here. You know, we did ask people to respond in advance, so since you, you're lucky you got in the door. Okay. We have a, you have a list of the other election officials. Oh, we have another list. That's right. We have some honored people from not the District of Columbia, so I'm not sure why we're mentioning them, but, but go ahead, Kojo. The ambassador from El Salvador to the U.S., Milena Mayorga. You know, again, hold your applause. We have a long list. The U.K. ambassador to the U.S., Dame Karen Peace, Pierce. Congressman-elect Glenn Ivey. Maryland State Delegate Julian Ivey. Mayor of Tacoma Park, Talissa Searcy. Chairman of Loudoun County, Phyllis Randall. Supervisor of Prince William County, Andrea Bailey, Regional Vice President for the NAACP, Reverend Cozy Bailey, and the Vice Mayor of the City of Falls Church, David Snyder. Thank you, Thank you all for coming, and don't forget our statehood effort. And now it's time for the invocation. We can call on Reverend Dr. Kendrick E. Curry. Good morning. Please pray with me as I pray according to my faith tradition. tradition. Let us pray together. Eternal and all wise God, the benevolent and merciful, in whom we all live, move, and have our being, we know that all things were created by you and there is no authority except you, and the authorities that exist are appointed by you. So today we are gathered and we thank you for this day that you've made and we are here at the great historic proceedings of the inaugural uh, inauguration of Mayor Muriel Bowser and the swearing in of Council Chair Phil Mendelson and Council Members Bonds, McDuffie, Nadeau, Fruman, Parker, Allen, and Attorney General Swa. We ask that you bless them and keep them in the discharge of their duties as assigned, that you make your face to shine upon them and be gracious unto them as they represent the best interests of the residents of the District of Columbia among the myriad of challenges in our city, including housing affordability, opioid abuse, and the senseless violence in our streets, that you lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace as they work together so that all families in all eight wards have the resources and the retail, the educational opportunities to thrive and not merely survive. We ask, O oh God, that you grant them the faith for them to lead fearlessly and courageously, the wisdom to discern and make the right decisions on our behalf the humility to see all residents have worth, dignity, and deserve to be heard, and the compassion to generously give to of themselves as they give for the greater good of public service, so that now one D.C. can prosper together. Almighty God, we ask that you help these leaders and every single resident in our nation's capital. Where there is confusion, please bring clarity. 
where there's division, bring unity, where there's unforgiveness, bring understanding, where there's fear, bring faith, where there's selfishness, bring selflessness, where there's injustice, bring justice. So that ultimately the District of Columbia, or should I say the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth is one people gathered in one place, one time, on one accord, and we will be able to come for the common good by God's Spirit. We ask that you bless the families and the homes of those who have been elected, and where they've been elected to serve, be with them in every capacity. Bless and keep every single resident who lives, works, and plays, and worships in the District of Columbia. I humbly ask this in the name of the one who taught me to love the Lord thy God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love my neighbors as myself. Jesus the Christ, amen. Uh, this is the part where the clock really starts ticking. Yes, we're, <clears throat> we're about to have a member of Congress come up. Let the record show that so far we're on time. And we've checked her <laughs> resume. Everything in her resume checks out. <laughs> Please give a warm welcome to Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. For brief remarks. For brief remarks. Members, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and congratulate all our elected officials on your swearing in. In the 118th Congress, which starts tomorrow, the District of Columbia will have opportunities to advance statehood. But, But we will also face threats to home rule. In the 117th Congress, D.C. continued its historic progress on our march to statehood. The House passed our D.C. statehood bill, which was only the second time in history uh, that a chamber had passed the bill. The first was when the House passed it in the, in the 116th Congress. The Senate held its second ever hearing on the bill, and the bill had a record number of Senate co-sponsors, led by our champion, Senator Tom Carper. The Biden administration strongly endorsed the bill. In the 118th Congress, I will continue to urge the Senate to hold its first ever floor vote on the bill. That vote will help bring national attention to the disenfranchisement of D.C. residents. We also made historic progress on home rule in the 117th Congress. For example, the House twice passed our bill to give the mayor control over the D.C. National Guard and the House Committee on Oversight and Ref Yes. On Oversight and Reform passed our bill to give D.C. exclusive control over prosecutions and clemency for D.C. crimes and to repeal the congressional review period for D.C. legislation. As we mark the 50th anniversary this year of the D.C. Home Rule Act, we will likely fa face the greatest threats in the Congress to home rule since the 1990s. Republicans may try to further restrict D.C.'s limited home rule or even try to eliminate home rule altogether, as several House Republicans have said they will try to do. We will defeat any such attempts. <laughs> House and Senate Republicans will likely introduce many bills to block or repeal D.C. laws or impose laws on D.C. In fact, House Republican leadership has announced that one of the first 10 bills they will bring to the floor for a vote will permanently prohibit D.C. from spending local funds on abortion. In the 117th Congress, the House and Senate Republicans introduced more than 30 standalone and home rule, anti-home rule bills and amendments. We defeated all of them, though the Senate Republicans 
were able to use the threat of a filibuster to airdrop the abortion and marijuana riders into the final D.C. appropriations bills. We will fight to defeat each and every anti-home rule bill, amendment, and rider. D.C. will not be fighting alone. We will have a Democratic Senate and a Democratic President. However, that is not a guarantee against the ena enactment of anti-home rule legislation, especially through riders on must-pass bills. As many of you will recall, the abortion rider was reimposed in 2011, and the marijuana rider was imposed in 2014, despite Democrats controlling the Senate and the presidency at the time. Moreover, to my great disappointment, the Biden administration has not always supported home rule. I look forward to working with D.C. elected officials, uh, especially those uh, that will come forward today, uh, D.C. residents and our allies in Congress and across the country to advance D.C. statehood and to defend D.C. home rule in the 118th Congress. We should not despair. Let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. We will now begin the process of swearing in. I think that's the reason we're here. Did they have to have a co-host? <laughs> We will begin with the swearing in for the Attorney General elect Brian Schwab. <clears throat> the oath will be administered by the Honorable Robert L. Wilkins, United States District Judge, United States Court of Appeals. And now we will call on the, uh, the them. them to all approach the stage. And how much time do they have? It, well, he gets a couple of minutes to get up here and he gets three minutes to speak, and not Ms. Norton's three minutes. <laughs> okay. Brian Schwab. My family's coming. We have a, a moment for family and friends to come up and join them for this historic moment. All right, uh, please repeat after me. I, Brian Lawrence Schwab. I, Brian Lawrence Schwab. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The laws of the United States of America and of the District of Columbia. The laws of the United States of America and the District of Columbia. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully discharge. The duties of the Office of the Attorney General for the District of Columbia. The duties of the Office of the Attorney General for the District of Columbia. On which I am about to enter. On which I am about to enter. Congratulations. Right. Thank you. following directions. Good morning and, and Happy New Year. The new year is a time for reflection and recommitment. In the coming year, what are we going to commit to doing in order to live our best lives? Elections are also an opportunity for reflection and recommitment. In casting their votes, D.C. residents express what they expect their elected leaders to do to help them live their best lives. I'm humbled by the trust district residents have placed in me to represent them, to advocate for them, 
and to use the law to help them make their lives better and safer. I'm a third generation Washingtonian. My mother, Estelle, grew up here, as did her father, my grandfather, Sam. My wife, Mickey Simon, and I have been blessed to live, work, and raise three amazing daughters here. In my unbiased view, there is no better place in the world to live than the nation's capital. We enjoy an abundance of resources, environmental beauty, cultural treasure, financial stability. We grow, attract, and retain extraordinary human talent. We are awash in resources that fuel growth, innovation, and prosperity. But we face persistent inequities. Far too often, our abundant resources and the opportunities that those resources create are not shared equally. And as a result, some, but not all, Washingtonians are sharing in our prosperity. How, how do we close widening gaps in income, in home ownership, in business ownership, and access to health care? How do we make sure that hardworking people that built our city and that make it run every day can afford to live here? We also face violence and trauma. Everyone deserves to feel safe in their neighborhood walking their dog, shopping for groceries, going to school? How do we protect our neighbors from gun violence and traffic violence? How do we ensure that parents see their children grow up healthy? And we face threats to our democratic values. How do we preserve fundamental rights, rights to reproductive freedom, to love who we choose, to be free from racism, bigotry, and hate? As I reflect on these questions, and where we look for answers regarding equity, safety, and democracy, I think about advice my father gave me. Today, January 2nd, would have been my dad's 87th birthday. When he left the Justice Department in the mid-60s, many of the firms in this city would not hire him because he was Jewish. I can only imagine how he'd feel seeing his son standing on this stage taking the oath of office as Attorney General. Dad's, dad's, advice, dad's advice was simple. God gives us two ears and one mouth for a reason. We have to listen twice as much as we talk. As your independently elected attorney general, I will listen to everyone. And I will collaborate with anyone who has our city's best interests at heart. But I will be beholden to no one. Strengthening the independence of the attorney general is one way we fight for equity. It's how we ensure our seniors our workers, our tenants, our consumers, and our environment are protected from powerful forces that would seek to profit by taking unfair advantage. An independent attorney general is also essential as we strive toward fuller representative democracy, expanded home rule, and statehood. On this note, a message to Capitol Hill. Regardless of party, I pledge to be a partner with you in good faith. We don't have to agree on everything, before we work together on anything. But make, mo make no mistake, Washingtonians have put their trust in me to stand up for our rights, our autonomy, and our values, and I will not let them down. <laughs> District residents have repeatedly told me that in addition to being an independent advocate for equity, democracy, they expect the Office of Attorney General to focus on accountability, especially our collective obligation to improve public safety. In D.C., the Office of Attorney General is responsible for prosecuting juvenile crime. Under my leadership, we will prosecute crimes fairly and with integrity and when we have the evidence to do so. But prosecution happens after the fact. To make our community safer, we must stop crime before it happens. Now, we know that access to stable housing, healthy food, mental health counseling, and structured and safe places during and out of school are all critical in making sure young people grow up healthy and hopeful about their futures. And hopeful kids are safer to themselves and to everyone around them. Locking up young people does not make us safer. We need to elevate, we need to celebrate, and we need to cultivate young people. Kids are biologically hardwired to take risk and make mistakes. But too many young people in Washington, D.C. don't have the privilege of learning from their mistakes without risking their liberty, 
or their lives. We do have to hold people accountable, and we will. But accountability is a two-way street. As government officials and community leaders, we also need to hold ourselves accountable. We are all accountable to hold and invest wisely in the future of our kids. After all, their future is our future. As elected Attorney General, I am a temporary steward of this office. I will strive every day to leave it in better shape than I find it, and I find it in pretty darn good shape. We should be proud of the Office of Attorney General. It is independent, it is effective, it is a law office full of the talent and smarts and diversity and grit that a city like Washington, D.C., full of talent, smart, diverse, and gritty people deserves. It has a legacy of excellence that I pledge to carry forward because I believe the law in the hands of smart, hardworking, committed professionals is the single greatest tool we have to make the district the place, indeed the state, we deserve it to be. So with this new year, let us commit to collaborating, to holding ourselves accountable, and to listening. Because if we do, we'll realize the promise of this great city. We'll build a community where prosperity is shared, where democratic rights are secured, and where everyone in every neighborhood is safe. Thank you. And now on to the legislature. We will now begin the oath of office for each council member who is receiving the oath of office today, beginning with the Honorable Brianne K. Nadeau, the council member of Ward 1. The oath is being administered by the Honorable Julie R. Breslow, Magistrate Judge, Superior Court of the District of Columbia, and Tom and I have received new instructions about where they have to stand. Yes. the. <laughs> The judge stands on that side. That side. You're the judge mm -hmm. and I'm swearing. Exactly. Do I get five minutes to speak? No. Oh. <laughs> anyway, all the, all the supporters of the uh, council member in Nadeau, please come up. We're going to try to keep on schedule. And if you feel Kojo and me walking up behind you, there's a time code right here. See what the time codes, general, timekeeper? He's timekeeper. <laughs> Wave that so everybody sees. There's a timekeeper right there. He's going to enforce whatever. Okay. I'm swearing, and you've got to be on this side. Oh, we're switching? Yes. Yeah. You're on oh, this we're... side, the judge is on this side. Okay. It's just okay. Canada and the judge here. Okay. There you go. Okay. Change the rules. Okay. And you've got spread one all the way. X, there X marks the spot, so and you shoot there, there. Okay. it makes a difference to me. Sure. And you're on the X. So, can you hold Mama's hand? No? Okay. Her choice. Right. All right. I, Brianna Doe. I, Brianna Doe. Do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States and of the District of Columbia, the laws of the United States and the District of Columbia, and will to the best of my ability, and will to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, and the District of Columbia Home Rule Act, and the District of Columbia Home Rule Act, and will faithfully discharge the duties, and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of the member of the Council of the District of Columbia, of the office of the member of the Council of the District of Columbia, on which I am about to enter, on which I am about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm grateful to stand here today with the partnership and support of our community in Ward 1 and beyond. I'm here with my council and campaign staff, past and present, and my beloved family, 
my mother, Davida, my husband, Jason, and my daughters, Zoe and Madeline. Thank you all for your love, encouragement, and support. You've undoubtedly heard me call Ward 1 the most diverse ward in the district, and that's something I fight to preserve every day. And though the boundaries of our ward have not changed for many years, what happens within our boundaries is dynamic and ever-changing. This afternoon, I'll be making history by swearing in the commissioners of ANC 1E and ensuring that the eastern part of Ward 1 will have its own representation at our most local level. I could give you a long list of things we've accomplished together over the past eight years, but instead, I want to focus on several collaborative efforts that illustrate the complexity and beauty of this work. If Ward 1 is the heart of DC, then Columbia Heights is the heart of Ward 1. It's our melting pot, that's right. Two decades ago, hundreds of people came together to design the public space in Columbia Heights. And even today, dozens of those folks are still engaged in helping it meet its full potential. As council member, I started out early convening residents, business leaders, and government offices to address ongoing maintenance issues and human services needs. With seemingly no hope of the formation of a bid, I established a Main Street program now run by District Bridges. Residents volunteered their time, ANCs pitched in, but several years ago, it became clear that the issues we faced needed still more resources. By establishing a grant for a plaza manager, we now have a dedicated person at District Bridges engaging those suffering from substance use disorder, and it's working. In the first month of the program, a handful of men made the choice to go to rehab. Then there were more. One day this summer, there were 38 men who approached our plaza manager wanting to get sober and healthy. Through this work, we are also now able to do more public programming. Whether it's exercise programs or holiday festivals, we're starting to see our public spaces in Columbia Heights live up to that vision laid out nearly 20 years ago. And that's one of the things I love most about Ward 1. We have big plans. Folks are willing to pitch in to make them come together, and we never give up. And we're doing this work in all the neighborhoods across the ward, not just Columbia Heights. Ward 1 is also a place where we have not only a significant number of vulnerable residents, but also many residents who care very deeply about helping others. That's why I sought out the chairmanship of the Committee on Human Services, and it's why I persevered in advancing the piece of legislation for which I am most proud, the Homes and Hearts Amendment. For years, I heard from those who work directly with our homeless residents about the need for more housing, the only true solution for homelessness. Each year, I added millions of dollars to the budget and helped house hundreds more people, but it never seemed like it was enough. In such a wealthy city, surely we could come together to end homelessness. So that's what I aim to do. Thank you. <laughs> By raising taxes on wealthy Washingtonians, the council was able to fund $65 million annually, ending homelessness for thousands of people. Thousands of people who will have their own place to call home after living on the streets for sometimes decades, who will get the health care and supports they need and live the dignified lives that all Washingtonians deserve. Thank you to all who worked for the passage of Homes and Hearts. It is an accomplishment for which we should all be proud. I'm thrilled that I'll now be moving on to chair the Committee on Public Works and Operations. The Department of Public Works touches many aspects of daily living and the quality of life in the district and in our ward. We know how dedicated the DPW workforce is and how hard their work has been throughout the pandemic. I'm committed to working with them to reduce waste, keep our streets and neighborhood clean, and address parking challenges across the city. And I look forward to working with a new director to lift up this agency for all our residents. The committee will also have oversight of other agencies that protect consumers and provide basic and necessary services for our residents, and I'm excited to get started. There's work ahead of us to make our ward and our city vibrant, livable, and equitable, to keep our streets and communities safe for all, and the difficult but attainable work of preserving and protecting affordable housing everywhere across the district. The past several years have brought incredible challenges that many would have found insurmountable, but in the District of Columbia, we are practiced at coming together to triumph over these threats. That's how we've managed through a global pandemic, through the capital insurrection, the reversal of Roe, and through constant threats to our autonomy, even as we get closer and closer to statehood. We are tough, we are strong, but we are also collaborative and caring. And that's what makes me most proud to serve as your Ward 1 Council member. When I stood here eight years ago, I pledged I would do this work in partnership with residents, and that's what I've done. Whether you've sent me an email or a DM, attended my monthly community office hours, or offered testimony on a bill, I've brought your ideas, input, and experiences to life through my efforts on the council. Thank you for your trust and belief in me. I'm so excited to get back to work.
note she said she's uh, going to be the chair of the Public Works Committee as of tomorrow. You know, they handle parking tickets. So if you have any parking tickets. And she came in under the limit. Well, she's like two seconds over. <laughs> Next up is the, the new guy. Honorable Matthew Fruman, council member of Ward 3. <laughs> so he's a new guy. That's, that's good. I knew you would get elected when I saw him following me one day. <laughs> the oath will be administered by the Honorable Russell F. Kanan, Associate Judge, Superior Court of the District of Columbia. Honorable Matthew Come Fruman. Come on, please. Take the oath. I sure am. <laughs> Please repeat after me. I, Matthew Fruman. I, Matthew Fruman. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The laws of the United States of America. The laws of the United States of America. And of the District of Columbia. And of the District of Columbia. And will. And will. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the District of Columbia Home Rule Act. And the District of Columbia Home Rule Act. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of member of the Council of the District of Columbia. Of member of the Council of the District of Columbia. On which I am about to enter. On which I am about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. I am so grateful and excited to take that oath. It is an honor to embark on this important work. It may be that every period feels particularly daunting, but this one certainly does with the dual challenges coming in part from the aftershocks of COVID. First, economic growth is not what it once was. COVID only made more acute the competition we face from smaller cities around the country and new dynamic hubs in the region. Our central core and tax base are vulnerable in ways that we have not seen in decades. We must ensure our downtown and economic base return to an upward trajectory and our tax base is resilient. But second, one need not be a social scientist to see and feel the trauma flowing through our communities in the wake of COVID, particularly in those in which hope already was in short supply. And a place with many thousands of people with little hope cannot be a place of justice or safety. These are different challenges, arguably pulling in different directions, but we must tackle them both. Doing so will require focus, creativity, eschewing ideology, and an ability to work together. Happily, all exist in abundance in our city leadership with a broad cross-section of earnest and talented voices. Your two new council members are a young, charismatic, gay, African-American man and an old white grandfather. I'll let you guess which one I am. <laughs> We, we have a ton in common, but we bring very different life, life experiences to the council table, and there's something beautiful about that. I've had the privilege to work with and get to know all of my now colleagues, from our skilled and deeply committed mayor, chair, and incoming attorney general, to my extraordinary colleagues on the council. As I set out on the important project of working with them, I will think about what brought me to this moment and the responsibility that comes with it. As I got in this race, I felt confidence that, that I would get to this day. 
The one question was whether my grassroots base could weather the Washington Post and an onslaught of outside money. I expected a quarter of a million dollars to be spent to block me getting onto the council. It ended up being a half a million, and it was never close. As I traveled the community every day, someone seeing me in my t-shirt said something like, oh, Fruman, I'm for Fruman. And I got to say, I am Fruman. <laughs> <laughs> And invariably, they said that some friends of theirs had talked to them about me and vouched for me and said, on, based on personal experience with me or with my wife, that they were supporting me. And that's where my support come, came from. As those serving uh, in elected office know, with those conversations between voters that we're not a part of comes responsibility. We owe our chance to make a difference to those who vouched for us and invested confidence in us. I'm also humbled that I fill big shoes. Mary Che was an extraordinary council member, ably serving the ward and city and pressing the district to be a global leader on the environment, animal rights, and fighting hunger. Over 150 years ago, the great abolitionist Senator Charles Sumner, in a different time when it was a good thing that radical Republicans had power, uh, said of Washington, D.C. and the, and the issues of social justice that Washington should be a leader, an example for all the land. Our ambition should be no less today. My pledge today is that I will do all I can, draw on all my skill and all my life experience to work with others to make the city a more just, prosperous, green place and a great place to live, learn, work, raise a family, and age in place. And while we're at it, let's make the Douglas Commonwealth the 51st state and change the trajectory of the history of this country. Thank you for this opportunity to serve and make a positive difference. now another new guy. How was that on time? That was on time. That was on time? Well, let's hope we keep it that way. Next up is the, the... The timekeeper has to stay awake, though. The timekeeper fell asleep? Yeah. No, no. I'm not accusing of him, him of anything. Well, he's sitting next to Jack Evans. It was just a warning shot. <laughs> next ahead, up is the Honorable Zachary Parker, council member of Ward 5. The oath will be administered by the Honorable Anna Blackburn Grigsby, Rigsby, Chief Judge of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Are you ready to take the oath of office? I am, I am. I'm, I'm being told to wait a second. Mm -hmm. can't start without. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? I'm well. Thank you. There's more room. He exceeded his time. Can I ask if I had any share Oh, yes. Now, are you ready to take the <laughs> I am ready. I am ready. <laughs> Would you please raise your right hand and repeat after me? I state your name. I, Zachary Parker. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. Will faithfully execute. The laws of the United States of America. The laws of the United States of America. And of the District of Columbia and the laws of the District of Columbia. And I will defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And I will defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And the District of Columbia Home Rule Act. And the District of Columbia Home Rule Act. 
and I will faithfully discharge and I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office the duties of the office of member of the Council of the District of Columbia a member of the Council of the District of Columbia on which I am about to enter on which I'm about to enter congratulations thank you, thank you. Thank you all for your patience, uh, and good morning, DC. I want to first start by uh, extending congratulations uh, to our mayor, Muriel Bowser, on a historic swearing in that is yet to come, to Chairman Mendelson and Council Members Bonds, McDuffie, Nadeau, and Allen on your reelections. I also want to give a special uh, congratulations to the other freshman council member up here, uh, Matt Fruman. Uh, it will be great to have another educator or education advocate rather on the council. I, for one, first and foremost, will always be an educator. It's always an honor to share the stage with our warrior on the hill, Congresswoman Norton. Uh, congratulations to you as well as to our newly minted uh, Attorney General Brian Schwab. Thanks to the judges who have joined us to officiate today's swearing-in ceremonies, uh, particularly Chief Judge Anna Blackburn Rigsby. Uh, and thanks to my family and friends who've traveled near and far to be here today. Uh, and every member of Team Zachary, uh, you know who you are. Your unwavering commitment and support means the world to me. When I was here four years ago giving remarks after being sworn in to the State Board of Education, I referenced the classic line from Charles Dickens's uh, A Tale of Two Cities. It is the best of times, it is the worst of times. And I referenced that line to describe the disparities that exist within DC and within our schools, where for many, it is the best of time and they're flush with resources, uh, but for many more, it is the worst of times uh, and people are holding on for dear life. And I stand here knowing that despite the disparities that persist, Washington, D.C. is the greatest city in the world and one day will become the 51st state of the United States of America. So keeping with that tradition, I started uh, at my swearing in four years ago. Today I want to call on another literary work, this time by uh, the brilliant James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time. One can give nothing with whatever without giving oneself. That is to say, risking oneself, Baldwin writes. He says, if one cannot risk oneself, then one is simply incapable of giving. I stand here today knowing that what I can give to Ward 5 neighbors and district residents is directly related to what I am willing to risk. Uh, neighbors have cast their votes, their sacred votes, uh, for me to risk standing alone for those things that are right and what's good for the greater good. Uh, neighbors have cast their votes uh, for me taking, risking, taking on the darts and arrows that are commonplace in this business uh, to fight for their interests. And you know, and I agree, that we cannot mistake absolutism for principle or continue to put profit over people or bastardize words like equity while upholding systems that disadvantage black folks and brown folks and poor folks. Bowen also teaches us that change is renewal and that nothing is constant. I'm humbled that my election represents needed change in Ward 5 and on the DC Council as the district emerges from a global pandemic. By one of the widest margins seen this election cycle, Ward 5 and neighbors elected an educator born on the south side of Chicago with a simple va vision that all district residents deserve good and an accountable government. That means we must serve as responsible stewards of the district's resources, examining how we spend taxpayer money while also making sure that we extend support to those in greatest need. It also means making government more accessible and accountable to you, the people. What's more, for the first time since 2015, there will be an out gay member on the council, and for the first time ever, that council member will be black. With this honor comes the responsibility to address the ridiculously high rates of queer youth homelessness, 
fight to protect federal protections that are under assault just by officials just down the street, and ensure that we're investing more in the people and organizations fighting every day for our LGBTQIA plus neighbors. So today, and I'm wrapping, if you are feeling the same calling for renewal in the district that I do, where all neighbors have a shared quality of life and can live in safe and healthy communities, and where natives and residents who have long lived in the district can benefit from this city's growing prosperity. If you feel the same responsibility that I do to give voice to communities that are often overlooked and to prioritize getting things done versus scoring political points, then I invite you to join me on this journey. For when times change, so must we, and the time has found us uh, to chart a new path for the district's renewal. Thank you again, Ward 5. It is the honor of my life to represent this community that I love. Thank you. Finally gotten to my ward. <laughs> well, earlier you recognized some of the former members of the council who are here, and someone just whispered to me on stage, did you see Tommy just snuck in? Who is the Tommy to whom that person was referring? Former at-large council member Tommy Wells. Tommy Wells. <laughs> who gave you his name, Tommy? <laughs> no. Could he sneak up here? No, it was the next guy who was coming up here who gave me his name. Oh. And that would be the Honorable Charles Allen, Council Member of Ward 6. The oath will be administered by the Honorable Nicole Hopkins, Administrative Law Judge in the District of Columbia, Office of Administrative Hearings. And I know you have previously warned Council Member Allen that you are likely to he was cut unopposed him off. for election, so instead of getting five minutes, I told him he should get three. <laughs> but we'll see if he follows that. Councilmember Allen and Judge Hopkins. Please state your name. I, please state your name. I, Charles Allen. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. Oh goodness, that was a long one. <laughs> that I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. And the District of Columbia. And the District of Columbia. And will. And will. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Preserve protect and defend preserve protect and defend the constitution of the united states the constitution of the united states and the district of columbia home rule act and the district of columbia home rule act and will faithfully discharge and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office the duties of the office of member of the council of, of the district of columbia of member of the council of the district of columbia on which I am about to enter. On which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. It's a really big book. If you believe it, our son told us he was really nervous last night and he wasn't sure he was going to come up on stage. So, good job. Good job. Thank you all very much, and good morning, D.C. Uh, first, let me thank my dear friend, the Honorable Nicole Hopkins, for administering my oath of office. Judge Hopkins and I met about a decade ago outside a polling location in Ward 6 as she was running to serve our city as an ANC commissioner. Not only did she win that election and serve her community as a commissioner, she ended up helping me win my election a couple of years later. She came on to become an invaluable member of my team, a close and trusted friend, and now she serves her city again as an administrative law judge. I'm very proud of you, Nicole, and thank you for doing me the honor of swearing me today. And of course, the most important people that I need to thank are the three other people that were on the stage moments ago. First and foremost, to my wife, Jordy. She is my best friend, 
She is the first person to say yes to my good ideas and the person who can tell me no to my bad ideas like no one else on this earth. And to our kids. When I was first elected eight years ago, Cora was just two years old. Um, I held her in my arms as I took my oath. And then four years later, our family grew, and Everett was two years old. And I held him in my arms when I took my oath that day. Um, today, they are 10 and 6 years old. They are a little too big for me to hold and get sworn in at the exact same time. But I simply could not do this job and serve in this role without my family's support, their patience, their love, and their grace. I've missed a lot of dinners and bedtimes, and I'm so grateful to all three of you for this journey that we're on together. So thank you. Today marks a, a new beginning, not just a new year with new resolutions or a new term of office with new colleagues at our side, but a time when we should pause to measure what we've done, see the challenges ahead, and commit ourselves to chart a course together to meet them. And in doing so, we can't just nibble at the edges of a problem, but rather we must look to do big, bold things. And I know we can because we've done it before. Together, as one government, as one District of Columbia, we can, we have, and we must do big, bold things. As I reflect back to standing on this stage four years ago, I remember talking in my comments about the collective will we have to show in the face of some very daunting challenges. I referenced the well-known quote by Dr. King that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I noted that it doesn't simply bend on its own, but rather by the shared effort and force that we will apply together to shape that arc toward a, a more just and fair world. Four years, a single elected term, can feel short, but it can also be monumentally consequential for countless lives and even generations to follow. Four years ago on this stage, we were still a year away from a global pandemic that would reshape our lives and our futures. We had to come together from the leadership of our mayor to innovative actions by our council, to the resiliency and resolve of DC government workers to meet this unexpected challenge, and we did big things. Four years ago, some members in Congress, they wanted to come gunning for our autonomy and self-governance, but with our warrior on the Hill, Congresswoman Norton, she stared them down at every turn, and let me tell you, she does not blink first. Four years ago, we didn't think that a petulant and desperate president of the United States would try to bully the District of Columbia. But our mayor stood up and fought back against Donald Trump to protect our city and residents. And in the process, created Black Lives Matter Plaza that helped change the course of our nation's conversation. And four years ago, that movement to help confront a racial reckoning served as a catalyst for the council to confront injustice, injustice and racism here at home to make long overdue reforms to rewrite century old laws imposed on us by a Congress that either shared our same values or same background as the District of Columbia. We can do big things. We have and we must do more. And in each of the challenges we face down, inequity and injustice has been at the root. In fighting that inequity, breaking all and all too familiar territories of race, income, and zip code has to be at the center of our work. Two big things that I've championed and the council has delivered on coming in 2023 bear that out. First, this year, the district will roll out a monthly basic income for tens of thousands of working D.C. families, putting more than $30 million additional dollars this year, growing to more than $50 million over the next two years, into the hands of our lower-income residents to make their lives better. This is transformational. Whether it's helping pay the rent, whether it's helping pay the rent or child care, putting food on the table, or buying new clothes for the kids, this will make a tremendous impact on the quality of lives for so many D.C. residents when it feels like the cost of everything is going up and hope is in short supply. And second, as early as this summer, the district will lead the nation in seeing public transit as the public good that it is. And we will expand overnight bus routes into all eight wards. We will begin investing $10 million per year into better bus service for our residents. And importantly, we will make our buses fare-free for all riders. There's a reason that riders are excited, DC businesses are excited, bus operators are excited. They see a win-win-win that's possible when we do big things together to invest in our people, our businesses, and our metro. And looking forward to more big, bold things, we know that thanks to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and Inflation Reduction Act, billions of dollars are coming to the district over the next few years to invest in improving how transportation connects our city's neighborhoods and people, creates new jobs and careers to meet tomorrow's demands, and combating climate change to reshape the district's energy future to be more affordable and resilient. And yes, I feel you back there, Kojo, and I'll be wrapping up. 
I'm excited to have the opportunity to lead the Council's Transportation and the Environment Committee this new session to focus on the big, bold ideas that we can accomplish together to build a more connected, a more resilient, and a more equitable city for all. I'm excited to partner with the mayor in her third term, leading our city to tackle these big ideas and big challenges. I'm excited about partnering with all of my council colleagues to achieve bold ideas for our residents. These are things that we can do. We've done big things in, in times of chaos and adversity, and that's what gives me the confidence to know how we will meet our future. Our city looks to us to lead, our residents depend on bold actions, and the moment we face is demands nothing less. I'm incredibly grateful to the residents of Ward 6 and this city for giving me their trust and confidence to serve another term on the council. I'm excited to share this stage with my colleagues and I'm ready to deliver on the big, bold ideas you expect of us. So let's all get back to work. Thank you very much. You know, David Catania, I think, holds the longest speech, five minutes, which I think was 15. He'll correct me, I'm sure. At least he didn't get that far. He was headed there, though. <laughs> Next up is the Honorable Anita D. Bonds, Council Member at Large. What about, uh, uh, technically speaking? All right, my list says Anita Bonds is up next. She'll be, Anita Bonds will be next, next. We, I think we we're supposed to do Micta. Oh, it's going by this order. No, that's the wrong order. This is the right order. This is the last one. It doesn't matter? Well, let's do both. No. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Bonds asked if we wanted her up here. We always want you up here. Honorable Anita D. Bonds is council member at large, oath administered by the Honorable John P. Howard III, Associate Judge, District of Columbia Court of Appeal. Please raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I, Anita D. Bonds. I, Anita D. Bonds. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The laws of the United States of America. The laws of the United States of America. And of the District of Columbia. And of the District of Columbia. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the District of Columbia Home Rule Act, and the District of Columbia Home Rule Act, and will faithfully discharge, and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office, the duties of the office, of member of the Council of the District of Columbia, of member of the Council of the District of Columbia, on which I am about to enter on which I'm about to enter again. Congratulations, Council Thank Member. you, thank you, thank you, Joe. Thank you all. everyone and happy new year happy new year and to our congresswoman i want to give a special shout out uh, because she continues to be here with us again and again and hopefully is going to bring about statehood for the district of columbia <laughs> every day she works for that thank you Thank you very, very much. To Mayor Bowser, Chairman Mendelson, Council colleagues, Attorney General, Advisory Neighborhood Commissioners, I know you're here, our judges, families, friends, I'm honored to be here with you and incredibly excited to begin a new council term and continue my lifelong commitment to public service. I want to give a special thanks to my family that just left the dais and friends and supporters who have been there for me more than I could ever ask. Also, 
I want to thank you, DC, for trusting, all right, to serve, for trusting me to serve as one of your elected officials as our city moves into the future. I'm proud to represent and support the needs and hopes of residents across all eight wards. I want to say this loudly, and I know that you believe this too, D.C. voters rock. Yeah. My special gratitude to the many seniors that have never given up on D.C. Thanks for your strong participation in daily life, and especially thanks for your very strong participation in the recent election cycles. Give yourselves a big round of applause. And let me take a moment to recognize Judge Howard. He just swore me in as one of the DC Appeals Court's justices ever. He's one of the youngest ever. I see in him the same eagerness to serve the city as I felt years ago when I began my service. Thank you, Judge Howard. Thank you for standing with me. It is significant that today's ceremony is an opportunity to remind of the breath of our city, a diverse community of many races, ages, lifestyles, beliefs, and practices working for a more just and responsive society where everyone is appreciated for their talents histories and contributions to making a quality community that welcomes all. Much of my work at the council has focused on assuring that housing matters loom very large throughout the city, and you know it, including providing and passing meaningful legislation to protect residents and increase access to affordable rental housing and new opportunities for home ownership across the city. In fact, frequently I've been reminded that one of my main focuses for, for, was protecting the more than $1 billion annual housing budgets. With pride, I listen, I respond, I get answers, bring change and new solutions. I envision a government that enhances the lives of our residents, businesses, and workers while delivering essential services and opportunities for success even in today's unsettled economy. And let me just take a moment to speak to where I think we're going. That is to protect our seniors, advance our economy and small businesses and workers continue protecting affordable housing, expanding gun violence prevention initiatives and public safety services, and protect the environment, improving our infrastructure, air quality, and green space, and improving public education outcomes with intentional investments in our youth, our adult learners, educators, and our learning environments. Eagerly, I look forward to a new council assignment and continuing to tackle the challenges head on. Working with my council colleagues, we'll put our heads together on how to effectively fight for every resident, business, and worker. And we will continue to work making statehood for DC a reality in our lifetime. And so to the DC residents that have built their lives here know that your needs will continue to be my focus. In conclusion, thank you again for having confidence in me. During my next four years, I'm committed to responding to the concerns of our city, examining programs for best practices, pursuing equity and justice and peace, and making good DC trouble. Thank you. We're on the same page now. How come we're never asked to administer the oath? 
that because we're not judges? Well, we're part of the media, so we can't be trusted. <laughs> Next up is the Honorable Kenyon R. McDuffie, Council Member at Large, oath administered by the Honorable Eric P. Christian, Associate Judge, Superior Court of the District of Columbia, the Honorable Kenyon R. McDuffie, <clears throat> and the Posse. Uh, each council member, each member was told they could bring 10 people. <laughs> I hope they're more careful with the budget. <laughs> but I'm the only one from Stronghold, Mr. Tom. That's how DC natives do it. It takes a village, Tom Sherwood. Take the oath. I am ready. I state your name. I, Kenyon R. McDuffie, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. The laws of the United States of America and of the District of Columbia. And of the District of Columbia. And will. And will. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the District of Columbia Home Rule Act. And the District of Columbia Home Rule Act. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully discharge. Charge, the duties of the office, the duties of the office, of member of the Council of the District of Columbia, of member of the Council of the District of Columbia, on which I'm about to enter, on which I'm about to enter. Congratulations, thank Council you, Judge. My daughter told me to keep it brief. Madam Mayor Muriel Bowser, Mr. Attorney General, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, Chairman and members of the Council, members of the State Board of Education, Advisory Neighborhood Commissioners, Chief Judges Blacksbone Rigsby and Josie Herring and Judge Christian, and distinguished guests and all my fellow Washingtonians. I want to thank my outgoing colleagues for their contributions to the District of Columbia during their distinguished tenures on the D.C. Council and recognize my former colleagues as well. Today is a new day in Washington, D.C. The occasion calls for celebration, no doubt, especially given what we've experienced since we last assembled here four years ago. We faced an historic global pandemic and yet we've come together as a city. We witnessed residents and small business owners pers persevere through extraordinary grief and suffering, thousands of lives lost, countless, countless businesses shuttered. So we certainly should celebrate today, but simply not just our individual election victories. Rather, we must celebrate our collective resilience and all that we've accomplished in spite of the challenges that we face. It's your resilience that reminds me of what I was surrounded by growing up in a small, close-knit neighborhood called Stronghold. It's the resilience of four generations of my family that came before me and have given me the strength to fight, even when I felt like the odds were stacked against me. So please, take a moment, Tom, Kojo, and help me recognize 
the McDuffies that are here today, and all those people who are the reason that I am here standing before you as an ex at large council member. Now, I'm not going to name all the McDuffies individually, I promise. I want to especially recognize and thank my mom, Eileen. I want to recognize my two beautiful daughters, Casey and Josie. And I want to recognize my phenomenal wife, Princess. I love you all. They are my entire world, and I could not have done it without their support, encouragement, and of course, their patience throughout this journey. Today calls for a renewed commitment to making our city an even greater place to live, work, and raise a family. In 2023 and beyond, we must address the challenges that we are facing as a city. We have made some progress. We've taken bold action. But let me be clear, there is far more work to be done. We have an economy that has demonstrated resilience, consistent surpluses, AAA bond rating, fully funded pensions, and a strong way to day fund, Jack Evans. Every day, more businesses are removing the boards from their windows as a sign that DC is proudly open for business. Students have returned to school, our recreation centers and libraries and parks are breathing life back into our youth and our families and our seniors. But not everyone in our city has enjoyed the prosperity experience in the leading up to the pandemic. In fact, there are those who were left out even before the pandemic started, despite weathering the toughest times, only to bear an even greater burden the last couple of years. And tragically, Many of the lives lost over the last few years were not due to COVID-19. Gun violence continues to be a scourge on our city, just as it is in cities across the country. Together, we must work harder and smarter to reduce gun violence and to remove the barriers to education, health, employment that prevent some people from achieving greater prosperity in our city. And if anything, my election proves that people from different walks of life can unite to achieve a common goal. It proves that we're connected by similar hopes and shared values, regardless of which neighborhood you call home. My vision for our city is for every resident to have housing that they can actually afford. Yeah. In safe neighborhoods with healthy food options nearby, where parents can walk their kids to school, where people who want to work can earn a living wage, and where aspiring entrepreneurs can invest in their dreams of starting a small business. In short, it's a city that is more racially equitable, more socially just, and more economically inclusive. So, DC, this is my pledge to you. I stand ready to fight for all Washingtonians, but especially for those who feel disconnected, like their voices don't matter in the decision-making process. I'm going to continue to pour my heart and soul into this work to make sure that we recover from the pandemic stronger, safer, and more prosperous than ever before. And in closing, we're going to do that not just for some neighbors. We're going to do it for all neighbors in all eight wards. I did not come to the Wilson Building a decade ago by myself. Residents of Ward 5 put their faith in me, elected me as a representative on the council, and they took this journey with me. So today, as your at-large council member, I enter this office with an even larger tent, built with the resilience of our city, more than 700,000 residents, and all the workers across our city that make us tick. Finally, President Barack Obama said that if you're walking down the right path and you're willing to keep walking, eventually, you're going to make progress. Together. We've been walking down the right path, and I'm grateful for the tremendous progress we've made. But make no mistake, we have a lot more work to do. And I'm willing to keep walking in every quadrant, in every ward across the city. And if you all are willing to keep walking with me, we will rise together. Thank you all, Washington, D.C. I love you. God bless you. Let's go to work. You, you might have noticed we were walking, too. <laughs> yeah, we got the message. Just keep walking. Um, next up is the Honorable Phil Mendelson, Chairman Mendo. of the Council of the District of Columbia. The oath will be administered by the Honorable Anita Josie Herring, Chief Judge, Superior Court 
of the District of Columbia, the Honorable Phil Mendelson. I think it's fair to say these are the best of times. <laughs> are you ready to take the oath? Yes, I am. Okay. I, say I and your name. I, Phil Mendelson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The laws of the United States of America. The laws of the United States of America. And the District of Columbia. And the District of Columbia. And will to the best of my ability and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend, preserve, protect, and defend, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the District of Columbia Home Rule Act, and the District of Columbia Home Rule Act, and will faithfully discharge, and will faithfully discharge, the duties of the office of a member of the council, the duties of the office of a member of the council of the district of columbia of the district of columbia chair of the council chair of the council i added that on which i am about to enter on which i am about to enter congratulations thank to you, you. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Bowser, Congresswoman Norton, judges, colleagues, former council members, Mr. Attorney General, regional colleagues, dignitaries, and citizens of the District of Columbia, good morning. Good morning. It is a blessing to be here and an honor. First, I want to thank Chief Judge Anita Josie Herring for administering my oath of office. Chief Josie Herring was first appointed to the bench in 1997 by President Clinton. She was appointed Chief Judge of the Superior Court in October 2020. She's widely respected by her colleagues, and I am grateful for her being here today. I also want to acknowledge my daughter, Addie, who held the Bible while I took the oath of office. Addie is a graduate of the DC Public Schools, got her diploma from the Duke Ellington School of the Arts, and is now matriculating at Virginia Commonwealth University. Addie is one of the reasons we have a government, to provide opportunity for our children and to make possible their dreams. We are, as you know, unique, and our government with its limited home rule is unique. And so, uniquely, the council is a member of both the National League of Cities and the National Conference of State Legislatures. As chairman of the council, I have had the benefit in recent years of meeting with state legislative leaders and city council presidents. What I have learned is both sobering and inspiring. Sobering and inspiring because, for instance, every large city across America is struggling and overwhelmed with the problem of homelessness and insufficient affordable housing. And yet no city is doing as much as we are, utilizing every strategy we can think of and spending more per capita to preserve and create affordable housing. Sobering and inspiring because we're not doing enough in every city and every state and across the globe to reverse climate change and yet no city is doing more than we are. Sobering and inspiring because every large city in this nation is struggling with an achievement gap in public education. 
We're poor, black kids are far behind their affluent white brothers and sisters, and yet no city is more focused than we are in changing that. Our problems are, our problems are ours, our problems are not ours alone. As I approach the council's next two-year term, and my four-year term as chairman, I ask, what will we do? I will especially focus on education. Public education is the great equalizer in our society, or it is supposed to be. Four years ago, I suggested the Chancellor bring forth a Marshall Plan. I'm disappointed that did not happen. But we can focus, and I will focus, on specific strategies that will make a difference, such as improving literacy, reducing truancy, tackling teacher turnover, promoting budget stability in the individual schools, increasing resources to support at-risk students, and changing school climate. I want the achievement gap to close significantly. I want our national assessment scores to exceed the national average, and I want to see this as our goal for the next four years. With regard to housing, we cannot solve the housing affordability crisis without significant change in federal policy. But I will continue to work with colleagues to support the mayor's initiatives and to add to them. That's what we've done every year. I want to thank Councilmember Bonds for her work on this issue. Unfortunately, when the spotlight shone on the Public Housing Authority, people blamed her. I'm confident we will see change and improvement because access to housing is key to maintaining a racially and culturally diverse city. We are a leader in so many ways. We are a progressive leader in the country when it comes to workers, union friendly, a $16.10 minimum wage, the best universal leave program for all workers in the district, leader in the number of LEED certified buildings, an energy policy that leads the country in fighting climate change. We lead the country as one of the most financially stable governments. We have the most progressive individual income tax structure. And beginning this coming July, we will be the first large city in the United States to provide fare free bus service. We are undeniably progressive. When I talk to legislative leaders from other states, I am struck by the partisanship even within their own caucuses. Thankfully, our tradition embraces compromise. Citizens want government that works, that finds solutions, that makes our city better. While I am a firm believer in a strong legislature, I recognize that policies that have the support of both branches of government have the best chance of success. I'm honored to have been reelected this past fall, but I recognize that in that election, there was a fair amount of voter dissatisfaction. As I look to the next four years, I'm humbled to have your trust, but humbled also to do better. I believe the government should be an honest, efficient deliverer of services, and also that the district should help those least able to help themselves to develop the skills and end the cycle of poverty. The district, as the nation's capital, should be a model, a model of service delivery in public education, public safety, public works, and public health. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. I do want to note this uh, on a historic day for a reason that not, has not yet been mentioned. We are ahead of schedule. <laughs> that is indeed historic in a variety of ways, but it gives you the opportunity to make a long speech before we get to the swearing in of the mayor about other people you might see in the audience. Well, we would like to acknowledge someone who's here, very quietly sitting over there in the front row, who sneaked in and is not making a big scene. Would you please welcome former Mayor Adrian Fenty. And you know, can we take one more moment? You know, one person we should acknowledge who's not here, but we all have in our hearts, is Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland who announced he has cancer. <laughs> Congresswoman knows what a fighter he is on the Hill, not just for Maryland, for our own city. You're finished? Well, I would thank you for inviting me and Kojo for coming from the politics hour. It's very hard not to do the politics and just do the public policy, but I recognize the importance of the moment. Very good. Okay. 
Up next, the Honorable Muriel E. Bowser. the District of Columbia. The oath will be administered by the Honorable Anna Blackburn Rigsby, Chief Judge, District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Congratulations, Madam Mayor. I was trying to steal her speech. Mm. <laughs> Congratulations. Before I administer the oath, I have to say how honored I am at the historic third term as mayor of the District of Columbia. And I'm honored to be present here with all three branches of our local government, our legislative branch, our executive branch, and our judicial branch. Thank you, Judge. Mayor Bowser, are you ready to take the oath for your third historic term? I am, Judge. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Muriel Bowser. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The laws of the United States of America. The laws of the United States of America and of the District of Columbia. And of the District of Columbia. And I will, to the best of my ability. And I will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution of the United States of America. And I will faithfully discharge. And I will faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of mayor, of mayor, of the District of Columbia, of the District of Columbia, which I am about to enter, which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. That was her request. Thank you. 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 Mayor, as Secretary of State for the District of Columbia, I like to transfer the seal of the District of Columbia the third time to you, Mary Thank Bowser. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, DC. I want to thank you, Chief Judge Blackburn Rigsby. I want to thank you for swearing me in today and swearing me in the first time in 2007. Congresswoman Norton, Chairman Mendelson, Attorney General Schwab, members of the council, family and friends from all eight wards, friends from around our region and indeed from around our world, Good morning. I am Muriel Bowser. I am Joan and Joe Bowser's daughter. I am Miranda Bowser's mother. I am an ANC commissioner, a ward council member, and I am your mayor. I am standing here today honored to have taken this oath of office for the third time. And you know what they say about third times. They're a charm. But truly, a third time and a third term is a special opportunity because we have a mandate. We have a mandate from the people to be bold, to think big, to push the envelope, and above all else, to win for Washington, D.C. 
Now is the time to be bold and to set a course to win the tough fights ahead. Since the last time we were here in 2019, a lot has happened. Our lives were upended by a pandemic that isolated us from our friends and family, shut down our schools, and created new levels of uncertainty that we've never experienced before about our health, our lives, and our future. In the midst of the COVID pan pandemic, a racial reckoning brought protest and demonstrations to our streets. Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs took to the streets to demand accountability and justice. Black Americans demanded that our humanity be recognized and that Black Lives Matter be more than a mantra, but a collective commitment to justice. Here in DC, we embraced that movement, we made a mural, and we've turned it into a monument. We stood shoulder to shoulder in defense of our values, enduring one of the most dangerous attacks on American democracy. It was DC that took back the Capitol and ensured our democracy prevailed. From the pandemic to protests to an insurrection, we stood together. We made it through together. And now on the other side, I greet you today with more optimism and more hope for the future than ever before. Not a blind optimism, but one that is informed by a tested leader who knows where we are strong and who knows where we must be stronger. I'm optimistic about our future because I know our past. I know about the leaders, some you know well, and others you've never met. And I know our story. Everybody loves a winner and a good comeback. And that's DC's story, isn't it? Walter Washington, for whom this building is named, showed us how to win when he proved to the Congress what Washingtonians already knew, that we could govern ourselves. Business owners like Ben and Virginia Ali refused to be beat by the riots, the Green Line construction, and the crack epidemic, and they've been winning on U Street for 60 years. The mayor for life, Marion Barry, won for the downtown. When he enticed the wizards to come to downtown DC and brought with it new employers and residents and an economic revival that reverberates today. We celebrate the culture of DC and Chuck Brown, the godfather of Go-Go, who has been emulated by countless artists. Go-Go is now our official music, and Ron Moten is winning for the culture by bringing the new Go-Go Museum to Anacostia. Sharon Pratt won for women leaders when she blazed the trail by becoming the first black female elected in a major American city. <laughs> Mayor Williams set the bold goal of growing our city by 100,000 new residents in a decade, a goal that ignited a renaissance. Doug Williams, the first black quarterback to both start and win in a Super Bowl, showed us that no stage is too big. Mayor Fenty won when he demanded an educational system that gives every student, no matter zip, zip code, a high-performing school, and he led us through the last Great Recession. Students and families continue to win when Mayor Gray created free pre-K for all. And in the last eight years, we've taken big swings for DC too. Our population crested 700,000. We created an 800,000 job economy. We had a record number of visitors coming to DC each and every year. We drove down unemployment in Ward 7 and 8. We closed DC General and now we see our new Cedar Hill Regional Medical Center taking shape in Ward 8. Our bond rating is a triple A 
and our finances and reserves were and are the envy of mayors and governors across this country. We built a team of the best and brightest of DC government, 37,000 public servants who make us strong and help us win. And this is the team that got us through the darkest days in 2020. And we stuck with them too. We didn't have a single layoff or miss one paycheck during this pandemic. And now I'm proud to say DC is hiring. We remember when Vince Lombardi said that winning is not a sometime thing. It's an all the time thing. That's what he said. This is what I say. You win by winning. Every day, every project, every initiative, which for us has added up to 96 months of progress. But we know we can't rest on our laurels. We have convened a transition team to talk to our residents about our opportunities and challenges and to hear their big ideas. And I promise you this, we will make the best of the next four years, focusing on six big areas. We must and we will win back our downtown because it is the economic engine that allows us to invest in our schools, our safety net, and our public works. It is the proverbial goose that lays the golden egg. We've modernized our schools because of our growing downtown. We've built the largest housing production trust fund in the nation because of our growing downtown. We've created new and better social programs because of our growing downtown. And all of that is at risk if we can't change the space, fill the space, and bring the people back to our downtown. The good news is that we are already taking on pandemic-related challenges like population loss, revenue loss, and tourism recovery. But we know we need more and bolder action. We will reach for new heights, not just with our buildings, but with a renewed commitment and resources to attract great employers and good-paying jobs. Tools like our Vitality Fund, which attracts employers to our downtown, are just the start. Efforts like the Penn West Equity Initiative and Innovation District are a glimpse of what must happen. And of course, converting office space into housing is the key to unlocking the potential of a reimagined, more vibrant downtown. Right now, 20 5,000 people call downtown home. Here's our goal. We will add 15,000 residents over the next five years and 87,000 more before it's all said and done. So that's right, we have a new 100,000 resident goal. That's a bold goal, but the fact is, no matter what we do, it won't be fast enough without the help of the White House. The federal government represents one quarter of DC's pre-pandemic jobs and owns or leases one third of our office space. We need decisive action by the White House to either get most federal workers back to the office most of the time or to realign their vast property holdings for use by the local government, by nonprofits, by businesses, and by any user willing to revitalize it. America wins when the place where people come to join and change the world is buzzing. Buzzing with new graduates and interns, with the startup that has the big idea to meet with its federal partners, or business travelers who are coming to Washington to get work done. And of course, with the lobbyists on Capitol Hill. We partnered with the White House successfully many times, and I know we can do it again for what matters the most. The fight for our kids is the most pressing. We will win for students, teachers, and our schools. 
We were the first in the region to get our public schools open for in-person learning during the pandemic. And now the only district in the region who is experiencing enrollment growth. I'm proud that last month I made good on my promise to teachers with our historic teachers contract. We doubled the number of summer camps for our kids and we have enriching activities during the summer months with paid internships. Years ago, we made the district the fastest improving urban school district in the country. And now it's our time to make it the best urban school district in the country. The best place for students and the best place for families. We already built the best pre free pre-K in the nation. Now we will build the most robust free before and after school programs in the nation. <clears throat> I told you four years ago that what I want to be remembered for is that we had a relentless commitment to every Washingtonian getting a fair shot. That means that we provide a hand up to those who are struggling and we find ways to make the journey smoother for those who have made it to the middle class. We know that this is worth fighting for and we're making progress. We made historic investments in affordable housing, over $1.4 billion in the Housing Production Trust Fund alone. We have a new target. 20,000 new black homeowners by 2030. We raised the down payment amount for the home purchase program from $86,000 with Anita Bonds to $202,000. We provided property tax relief for our seniors with Anita Bonds and then made it possible for you to stay in your homes with the Safe at Home program. But we must commit to grow the middle in DC. And that includes helping the new graduate, whether a millennial or Gen Z, saddled with student debt, but with the dream to buy a starter home. We must help the single woman with a good income, but who's using most of it for housing. We must help the single mom making a great life for her kids on her own. We must help the double retirees trying to age in place. This is their DC too. And I know their story because that's my story. In part, what we are doing is promising to make sure that the city is a place where people with middle incomes choose to live. And in part, we're making that promise by saying we will not touch the residential property tax and we will find ways to provide more free activities for families. And second, as we keep fighting for those who are already in the middle class, we have to expand it. So over the next five years, we will add 35,000 new jobs in high growth industries and we will make sure that through the work of reimagining our high schools, that we will focus on these high growth industries, dual enrollment programs, and earn and learn opportunities in DC. Now, it's been said already today, we've been fighting for over 200 years for access to our nation's democracy, and we have wins to show for it. In 2020, we went toe to toe with a bully in the White House, when our nation was attacked, we fought back, and we advanced the, call, the cause of statehood further than ever before. But let me be clear, we will explore every strategy to get more control over our affairs, but we will not stop until we achieve full democracy, two senators, and admission as the 51st state. We know we have a friend in President Biden, and as this new co Congress starts, 
I promise to keep fighting for control over everything that we need in the district, protecting our bodily autonomy, the ability to tax and regulate our businesses, and to provide services to our justice-involved youth. The fight for a sustainable and resilient DC is another fight that we fight for our kids. We partnered with the US Department of Transportation to make generational projects come to fruition. The Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge, which was a win for DC workers, local businesses, and it better connects our city and region. I want to acknowledge and thank our Congresswoman who got the money, who persevered until we delivered the most beautiful bridge in the world. Now with $3 billion coming to us from the bipartisan infrastructure law, we will replicate that success across DC. We also know that a focus on climate change and the uncertainty that it poses is one of our biggest challenges. And as a C40 cities mayor, I have joined with mayors from around the world to develop innovative solutions that move DC closer to our goal of becoming a carbon neutral city by 2025. And when we plan for a more resilient future, we also have to challenge ourselves to think about our streets. We have made a big down payment in addressing dangerous roadways and intersections. But we also have to think bigger about how we use our streets to create more public space for our residents and businesses to come together to celebrate our city and to support our culture. Finally, and most importantly, as we look over the next four years, there's nothing more important than the safety of our residents, nothing more. Behind every act of violence in our community and behind all of the data that is tracked feverishly, we know that there are real people. Behind every murder statistic, there is a devastated family. Behind every violent robbery or carjacking, there is a ripple of trauma. Every time a child picks up a gun, a group of friends loses its innocence. And we know that we have made progress, but we also recognize that that progress has been incremental. We found programs that work like Pathways, which provides some of our most at-risk men job training, subsidized employment, and long-term support. Already more than 200 black men completed this intensive nine-week training. And while we have had successes, we know we must do more immediately. If a child, for example, commits a violent offense or uses a gun in our city, too often there is no consequence. When we send that child back to the same environment without intense intervention, we have failed that child in our community. We know, especially for our young people, that sometimes accountability is not punishment. It's a lifeline. And so sometimes the best way to save a child and change his trajectory is to require that they get the help they need and that they understand the consequences of their actions. So I'm here to tell everybody, we have the facilities, we have the programs that work to get kids on a better path. So we want to work with them if they've been adjudicated, and we want to work with them before they get involved in serious crime. My promise to you is this, to our kids and our community, is that we will use every lifeline to save our children. We are in a race to save lives, and it is critical that we not work in silos, and I promise to work with all the stakeholders on this stage and in this room to achieve what we need. When we work together, there's nothing we can't take on. Success is ours to grab. So in closing, I want to say thank you to the residents of this great city. 
the greatest city in the world, my hometown, for placing your trust in me for another four years. I want you to know that I believe as a city, we are only as strong as our ward that struggles the most. We are only as vibrant as our system of values and how it works to protect us and our rich diversity. And I want you to know that I believe that our political choices are only as sound as all of the voices that make them, not a narrow few. It demands that none of us is a slave to an ideology or popularity or too scared to make tough decisions. In recent years, our dialogue became increasingly political and erratic and too strident in our personal politics. That is our past. Our future is working together. And I will set the tone for my administration to work harder, smarter, and more engaged with all of our partners, those whose views we share and those with views we don't share. I'm honored to be your mayor. I'm committed and mark my words, we will come back. We will win and we will do it together. Thank you, DC. God bless you all and God bless the District of Columbia. Before we get to the benediction, Tom Sherwood, I think there are a couple of other people you wanted to acknowledge here today. There is the Hello. former Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, Justin Good Fairfax is here. And the Prince George's County State's Attorney, Aisha Brave Boy. Where is she? There she is there. there she is. Did we leave any, any, did we leave any, how about giving yourselves a round of applause for being here? Anybody else you want to applaud it? How about us? <laughs> Thank you, Kojo. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. It is now time for the benediction we call on Reverend Dr. Persavia T. Prelo. Good morning, esteemed mayor, council members, and all public servants and the residents of DC. It's an honor to offer this benedictory prayer. If you are able in body or spirit, please join me in standing for our benediction. As I pray in the God of my faith, let us pray together. You, oh God, has shown us what is good. And what is it, O oh God, that you require of us but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you? We pray, O oh God, that at the start of this new year, at the start of a new term of service, that you would allow our actions to be just that you would guide our just thoughts, our just decisions, our just way of being, our just way of serving, our just way of collaborating, that you would guide us. That the service we render for one DC in your name and by your spirit will break strongholds and tear down mountains and will move us beyond what separates us that we might be united that we might be united to make just decisions in our community, in our systems of education, in our homes, in our push for equitable housing, that we may serve to make government to be a government of the people. We ask, so oh God, that by your spirit that you would lead us in measures of justice that will promote transformation across our communities, that our places may be just peace that we may serve in ways that no one is fearful to speak truth to power. So we pray, oh God, that you would lead us in acts of justice that bring us to a place of liberation. 
Let our acts of justice, O oh God, remove challenge. Let our acts of justice not be hindered by fear. Let our acts of justice, O oh God, in just work and just love, instead be the light that you've given us to carry, that we may be inspired in our work to promote peace, to promote hope, to promote love, to promote kindness in the midst of our collaboration. And so, oh God, at the start of this new year, we ask that you will bless the mayor of D.C., that you will be with Mayor Bowser, oh God, that you would lead her and guide her and protect her and order her steps that with confidence she may serve you. We thank you for every council member and every judge and every resident of D.C., oh God. We pray for our nation, O oh God, and we pray for our local government. We pray for the right to vote, O oh God, that we may continue to show up as an act of public service guided by the faith you've given us. So order our steps in this new year. Make us all more stronger, all the more united, all the more better together as we let the light of your peace lead us and guide us in all truth and understanding. In this we pray together. And this I pray in the name of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless you. Thank you. Good to be with you. We want to thank the uh, secretary staff for putting on the program today. Kojo gets the last word. And ultimately, it's the most important word, and that is that on Friday at noon, there's a show called The Politics Hour that Tom Sherwood serves <laughs> as resident analyst and I serve as host. Please make sure you listen and thank you all for coming. Happy New Year Happy to you. Year.